This is a general disclaimer. Redlands Community College attempts to have the most accurate and up-to-date information listed in its content and delivery. However, your education is your responsibility. Redlands Community College or Roy Smith makes no guarantee in the accuracy of this information in this video and accepts no liability for the informational video. The information expressed is strictly the opinion of the author and the presenter, which is listed in the reference near the end of the video. This information is designed to supplement your own education or initial education and should not be used to replace any current academic program you are enrolled in. View the information and content at your own risk. Thank you. Okay, this is going to be Chapter 3, Neck and Facial Trauma and Key Concepts. Okay, this is going to be Chapter 3, Neck and Facial Trauma. And key concepts. Upon completion of this chapter, you'll understand the origin of most facial and neck trauma, the problem of disfigurement and functional sensory impairment with facial trauma, differentiation and classification of facial fractures, potential sight-threatening eye injuries, associated underlying injuries that are associated with facial and neck trauma, and then treatment priorities in facial and neck trauma. Overview. Head, face, and neck injuries. They can be isolated or multi-system trauma caused by blunt and or penetrating trauma and they range from minor to life-threatening. Assessment and effective treatment requires awareness in the mechanism of injury and the pathophysiology. Chief concerns can produce injuries to the face, ears, eyes, and neck. Each injury has unique characteristics, disfigurement, impairment of sensory organs, or the need for significant post-trauma care. Facial injuries commonly occur due to blunt trauma, and they are caused from assaults, motor vehicle crashes, and falls. They include facial fractures of the zygomatic arches and nasal bones, Lafort 1, 2, and 3 fractures, orbital fractures, mandibular fractures and dislocations, and dental malocclusion. This is kind of a picture here that we're going to show you zygomatic arches and nasal bones. They're common but rarely serious, which would be in this area here. Uh, nasal fractures, broken noses, and things like that. This is the Lafort fractures, and each one of them are more serious than the first, so it's kind of a progressive thing. A Lafort 1 fracture is a horizontal fracture of the maxilla that causes separation of the heart plate from the rest of the face. So this whole area here is separated. The heart plate that's in here, inside, is separated from the rest of the skull. A Lafort 2 fractures occurs slightly posteriorly and involves separation of the nasal bones and maxilla from the rest of the face. So the entire nasal bone area and whole upper deck here is generally movable. A Lafort 3 complete craniofacial dysfunction occurs when the fracture line is along the separation between the cranial bones and the facial bones. So we can actually get basilar skull on this as well. This whole area here, the whole front of the face, is movable. Um, figure 3-3 three, three in your book, two mechanisms thought to produce orbital blowout fractures are the buccal theory and the hydraulic theory. So if we'll notice here, these little areas here, this is a lot thinner than the orbit area. Uh, so one or two things occurs. Either it hits this and then the energy is delivered to the smaller bones in the orbit or strikes directly on and the pressure from hydrostatic pressure and the, and the fluid in the eye busts this area out or breaks it out. 
Uh, the extraocular muscles are responsible for moving the eye through its range of motions, and this is what moves it up and down, left and right, and will allow so much movement of the eyeball itself. Ocular injuries, we can have globe rusher, which is loss of the eyeball's integrity, and this is generally caused by direct force applied to the globe, also caused by penetrating trauma. Retinal detachments, uh, lifts from the posterior part of the globe, interrupts the blood supply and causes ischemia, results from a tear in the retina, also caused by uh, material buildup under the retina. Hyphema, which is blood clicks in the anterior chamber of the eye between the cornea and the iris, uh, results from direct trauma. Traumatic iritis, iris is contused and has difficulty contracting, uh, results from direct trauma. Subconjunctival hemorrhage, capillary leaks within the conjunctiva over the sclera, results from direct trauma, uh, occurs secondary to coughing and straining sometimes as well. Uh, eyelid lacerations uh, occur due to penetrating and blunt trauma, penetrating trauma, uh, projectile or sharp edge, and then blunt trauma, shearing forces applied to the face. Ear injuries caused by blunt or penetrating trauma. Tympanic membrane perforation uh, results in hearing loss caused by penetrating trauma to the tympanic membrane. Projectile cotton swab also can occur from barotrauma or blast injuries. Auricle hematoma or cauliflower ear uh, bleeding within the cartilage and soft tissues caused by direct blunt trauma may occur up to seven days after the injury, although most develop within several hours. And this is a perforated tympanic membrane. And then this area here probably should grab a, this area here would be the cauliflower ear bleeding. This can cause ischemia and loss of the actual cartilage tissue in there. Um, neck injuries. Neck is divided into zones. Uh, there are three anatomical zones used traditionally to classify the neck injury. They are zone three zone 2 and zone 1 and we'll talk about each one of those and kind of the injuries that might occur in this. Uh, obviously in the vascular beds lower in the neck this would be in zone 1 this might be a problem uh, lacerations penetrating trauma or anything like that in zone 2 this is actually our glottic opening in our airway penetrating trauma to this might not, uh, might interfere with our ability to intubate and then in zone 3 upper airway swelling and airway problems So neck injuries continue. Uh, necks divided into three zones. Management depends on the injury location. Uh, injuries include mid to lower airway, uh, which would have been in the middle there, can affect the ability to maintain a patent airway. Laryngeal tracheal injury can complicate attempts at airway management. Um, penetrating trauma to the neck uh, can be associated with chest trauma and head trauma, depending on the path of the projectile or object length. Vascular injuries can occur from both penetrating and blunt trauma. Blunt or penetrating injury to the carotid arteries uh, produces a dissection in the inner vessel walls. Injury to the vertebral arteries often occurs at the level where the arteries dissect, uh, disrupting blood supply or showering the brain with blood clots. And then laryngeal tracheal or vascular structure damage may occur due to hanging or strangulation. And this would be around the hyoid bone area. History includes mechanism of injury, provides a list of potential injuries, uh, and assists with the determining, determining the bleeding source. Uh, focus depends on the location. Traumatic injury to the ne uh, face or neck. The location, any associated symptoms that they might have. Other important factors when the actual injury occur or the timing of the injury. On examination, Isolate on the ABCs, airway breathing and circulation, assess and treat compromising conditions. Uh, treat the patient as a whole, then turn to the face and neck. Eyes, extraocular movement, pupillary reaction, visual acuity and hyphema, mouth smoothness and teeth, mid-face stability, neck deformities if there's any ecchymosis or lacerations, and then other body systems, any other body system involvement. On assessment, life-threatening injuries, maintain suspicion during assessment, uh, mechanism of injury, and any kind of historical information that we got, and anything that we found upon examination. Indicators, hoarseness and difficulty or painful swallowing, any kind of neurological symptoms, uh, significant mid-face ecchymosis or epistaxis or nose bleeding. 
Treatment, initial priorities are going to be our ABCs, airway breathing and circulation issues, and the airway issue, mid-face instability, often associated with significant intraoral or nasal bleeding, which can include the airway. <clears throat> Breathing issues as in attention pneumothorax and, and ventilation issues. Suction of the airway adjuncts should be utilized appropriately and as needed. In hemorrhage, <clears throat> there can be a significant amount due to the rich blood supply in the face and scalp. Appropriate hemorrhage control measures should be rapidly taken once the airway has been controlled. Scalp wounds may require direct pressure or pressure bandaging to control the bleeding or prevent hemorrhage or shock. Uh, after all of this is done, then treat the less severe injuries with supportive measures, and then spinal motion restriction or spinal immobilization. In evaluation, continuously monitor the airway. Position the patient appropriately. Uh, keep the airway clear and assess vital signs frequently. Disposition, potential multiple systems injuries, transport them to a level 1 or level 2 trauma center. If unable to maintain the appropriate airway, transport to the closest capable department significant facial injuries, ideally transport to a facility with a specialist, facial surgeon or ophthalmologist. Disposition, isolated neck injuries, most emergency departments are capable of initial assessment and management. Vascular injury transport, level 1 or level 2 trauma center or a facility with a vascular surgeon. In conclusion, facial injuries are very common, may be associated with other injuries. The majority of them are non-life threatening. More serious injuries, like airway bleeding and neck injury, are not common, but potentially life-threatening. References with, for this were taken from the Professional Paramedic, Volume 3, Trauma Care and EMS Operations of Del Mar Learning. If you have any questions concerning this chapter, my name is Roy Smith, smithrdmsa.net or 45219-7613. Thank you.